Right, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, this video is just going to review recovery planning in Australia and the success of uh, recovery efforts so far versus the money spent to achieve those results. So the government, yeah, has invested millions of dollars to date in recovery planning and the evidence-based question that I'm going to consider here is whether or not this has been money well spent. Uh, so yeah, Bottrell found out in their analysis of over 600 draft and approved recovery plans for more than 850 of 1163 species currently listed as threatened in Australia that the presence or absence of a recovery plan did not actually have a statistically significant effect on whether a species status was improving, stable or declining. Botcher's uh, results also suggested that recovery plans might not actually be that useful in the short term and a lot of ambiguity also surrounds whether or not they make a long-term tangible contribution to species recovery. Right. So yeah, that's a bit of a bit of a pickle. So two major contributing factors uh, here are the lack of basic accounting practices and the inconsistency seen uh, in document formatting of recovery planning efforts. So the difference between uh, a recovery plan for you know little um, small mammal in WA versus a recovery plan for a small mammal in uh, Queensland um, made you know 10 years apart five years apart they're very very different quite inconsistent so it's really hard to measure success so yeah and just to give a better idea of how to improve planning practice it's useful to review a few case study examples of um, some strengths and weaknesses in the government's uh, Commonwealth level uh, the government's government uh, current recovery planning strategies so yeah, an example of successful conservation planning within the budget is the Phytophthora cinnamoni or dieback threat abatement plan or TAP, where landscape level planning allowed recovery actions for an individual threatened species to be implemented on a massive scale with uh, really measurable results. The folly application of diluted phosphites is easy to implement given the scale of the you know the control method is pretty big, you know, doing stuff at a landscape scale. So yeah, the success of this uh, TAP in Achieving recovery goals for individual endangered plant species is due to the fact native floral species covered under the tap um, were linked by dieback as the common denominator for their conservation ranking in the first place. So yeah, this uh, illustrates the logic in following the guidelines set by Watson in developing recovery plans. Uh, so we need to be focusing our funding not on flagic species, but scalable level solutions that achieve measurable and timely recovery goals for an away array of otherwise impacted native species. However, this shift of expanding the national reserve system and rescuing and managing landscapes rather than focusing on individual species is only reflected in a relatively small proportion of recovery plans or threat abatement plans. Current weaknesses include the numerous understudied invasive species and the impact they have on the unique assemblages of uh, WA's flora and fauna. For instance, literature available on the potential impacts of feral cats uh, compared to the aesthetically pleasing invasive pest species such as the rainbow lorikeet and the laughing kookaburra. Only one scientific journal um, by DAFA, that's the Department of Food and Agriculture of Western Australia, has actually directly uh, addressed the question of potential environmental and agricultural impacts of the rainbow lorikeet. So yeah, and also, like, similarly, like, to date, no published articles have actually looked at the direct or indirect impacts of the laughing kookaburra on uh, native southwest Western Australian species assemblages. So, yeah, this is just a huge, huge inconsistency. Another major weakness has appeared to be a social and cultural issue. It's uh, from the point of the view of the general public, the definition and understanding of what a pest, um, what an invasive pest species is, is um, it's really poorly understood and it's generally like you know for quite a lot of personal bias, which is um, you know it really needs to be overcome if we're going to like really tackle pest species and you know for the outcome of improving biodiversity. So yeah, in Western Australia, the kookaburra is an introduced pest species from um, eastern parts of Australia, and it was allegedly released in Mullawa in around uh, 1896, and also in Perth in the 1900s. According to the WA, WA Museum, they were introduced intentionally to control snakes, and it was supposedly successful at reducing anecdotal snake, snake sightings, but it was noted by the WA Museum that they also preyed upon other native species and were threatening their numbers, and it's now widespread throughout the southwest of WA and does mine 
does minor damage to agriculture, displaces native species, increases na uh, resources competition, it uh, consumes small reptiles, and it's noted by Pauline and York to be a nest predator. Mes nest predator. That means that they eat eggs and the juveniles of other bird species. So essentially, you know, they eat baby birds of native bird species. And if that doesn't comprise a pest species, then, you know, like, we really, I've got to go back to the drawing board completely. This bird is an alien species to the, you know, the flora and fauna of WA. It's been introduced intentionally to control, you know, what was viewed as a pest at the time, snakes. When they're not a pest, they're native. Most of them would have been native animals at that time in the 1900s. And yeah, like, apparently there was a clear reduction in their numbers, so they clearly have a, a sizable impact um, on the native ecosystem. These birds can get pretty big. You know, pretty big, like, they seem to weigh like, good enough. Like, I'll attach a link to the bottom of this, um, you know, this video that we can, it compares you know, a size of you know, a really big adult kookaburra. Um, basically to this um, to someone's boot and it just gives you an idea of like this is how big the cool forests are this is how much they can they could be eating a fair few species you know just an individual family level they could be eating quite a quite a few um, native species and having a fair bit of impact so at a landscape level the entire population of southwest you know kookaburras has a pretty big impact and um well there would be some degree of impact we don't know because there's no research and that's something we really need to have a look at uh, it's probably um, <clears throat> it's probably because the kookaburra has an almost iconic status in the minds and the, in the minds of most Western Australians, and it's generally viewed as a stereotypical Aussie bird with like a very char characteristic call that's admired by some, and uh, possibly serves as a source of noise pollution for others uh, if you have to live near them. So you know, kind of like roosters when they wake you up, not very nice. But yeah, few people consider it to have any past status. Uh, however, like a certain number of uh, Southwest Western Australian farmers and landholders who are concerned with the bird's pest potential have, uh, yeah, begun to recognise the species as a pest, and uh, yeah, have begun to implement, um, you know, the like control methods that they find to you know, have worked. And these are guys here; you know, they're doing pretty good things, and you know, we it, it might. It's probably going to be too hard or too expensive just to do a basic study on how much damage they're doing. So we really need to get on top of this in you know, the science community. So yeah, um, likewise, the Rainbow Lorikeet was released into Perth in the 1960s. In 2004, its population was estimated at between 10,000 to 20,000 individuals. The Rainbow Lorikeet is an extremely attractive species uh, too, and yeah, they're often kept as pets. And so too, like kookaburras, they are few, um, seen by few people as a pet. In regards to recovery planning, um, the whole semantics and aesthetics of certain pet species is a problem that needs to be thoroughly addressed and overcome. And yeah, these same species are likely, uh, a lot, really likely to expand their range, increase in density, and perhaps inflict greater ecosystem damage. You know, if we don't do anything about it. So yeah, in summary, the seven main uh, recommendations to take home from this video are one, to set a standard for recovery planning, to change and adopt the landscape level outlook while giving consideration to key threatening processes and individual threatened communities and species. We should first look to save entire ecosystems based on com the common threats, then look at individual species and ecological communities within that uh, landscape. Uh, so number two would be, while a top-down methodology should be adopted, special consideration should still be given to individual species that are critically endangered and where extinction could be averted if adequate funding is provided. Uh, number three would be, template recovery plans should be devised by the um, Threatened Species Commission in consultation with the all relevant agencies and organisations, nationally and internationally where possible, and these templates should be regarded as a universal guideline when uh, individuals are structuring and drafting recovery plans for species and trained communities. Similarly, uh, templates should be developed for threat abatement plans and followed accordingly. Um, and yeah, number four, I also recommend that the Threatened Species Commission weigh up the biodiversity gains associated with using the different methods of reserve selection, species recovery planning, um, and you know, like single species versus multi species recovery plans, and also uh, threat abatement planning. The biodiversity gains then need to be considered against the cost of gathering additional data and the potential risk of making a decision which eventuates in suboptimal conservation outcomes due to uncertain data. 
and yeah, Nicholson uh, at our 2006, who's so got some interesting stuff. All the um, information you need to find those um, references uh, in the description. So yeah, number five, a uh, significant number of taxonomy groups, particularly fish, plant, um, and vertebrate species, are underrepresented in the national list of threatened species. So yeah, the listing process needs to be updated and made consistent across different agencies and better resources. All agencies nationwide need to ensure that the list is kept up to date and that cultural biases do not affect the listing process or a comprehensive uh, picture of the state of play of threatened species is made clear in the recovery plans. Um, yeah, and Watson and Masters have some good stuff on that. Um, yeah, number six, the Threat Species Commissioner should increase funding to the national database used to report exotic invertebrate breaches and incursions. Uh, that's uh, feralscan.org.au uh, if I'm right. Uh, it's currently run by PESMA and the Invasive Animals CRC. So, uh, yeah, Feralscan should be a better resource so that state specific pest animals are also included, like rainbow lorikeets, deer, uh, Asiatic water buffalo, brown bees, larvae. Virus, yabbies, and that sort of stuff. This tool should be robust enough to map populations of vertebrate and invertebrate pests and develop a risk assessment process for pest species which are present in Australia but not yet established. And yet to develop and enforce national pest animal welfare standards, and that's a really, really important um, message to take home. Yeah, you know, like animal welfare is something that needs to be really focused on in you know pest management. So yeah. My final recommendation, um, seven, uh, would be in line with that made in the parliamentary inquiry into the impacts on agriculture of pest animals, whereby the terms of reference for pest smart, deep, or all the relevant agencies all refer to pest animals and include vertebrates, um, all refer, refer to invasive pests or like you know, any sort of pest species as pest animals and include vertebrates and invertebrate pests. The criteria for what comprises a pest animal should be based from an ecological and uh, economic rationale rather than a cultural or aesthetic rationale. Yeah, that's pretty much it, and yeah, thanks for watching.